1996, the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board meeting to order. Um, minutes of the previous meeting, did everyone review and find any mistakes or no mistakes? Mr. I'll move the uh, minutes uh, approved as written. waivers for three of the lots and the it reads now public access waiver but I think it shouldn't read wetlands alteration permit is that correct Maureen actually the total application in incorporates four lots right but I'm talking about the second uh, sentence after that there are public access waivers for three of the lots and wetlands alteration permit is for the access road which crosses lot one and the existing pond. I believe that's correct. Because not all of the lots need a public access waiver. I'm suggesting these as corrections to the minutes. Those were that was everything that I had. Right, right. Okay, I see what you're saying. Mr. Emery. Mr. Chairman on uh Page 7, the first paragraph at the top of the page, uh, refers to a comment that I made regarding Cantor Lane that uh, the site distances, it reads, the site distances should be developed according to typical standards at the entrance of the access road. My uh, recollection of the discussion was that the, uh, the uh, roads were so narrow and the speed limits theoretically so low that typical site distances really probably would not apply. Um, in any event, that uh, I didn't want the site distances to uh, be highway standards uh, for such narrow, narrow roads. <clears throat> okay, anything else from anyone? We have a second as corrected. Why not? Okay. I'll just change the motion to as amended. Second as amended. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Okay, correspondence. Um, in addition to the items in our packet, uh, the ride, there was one item on the podium tonight. A letter from the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission addressing both. Um, Dominicans Crossing um, plan and also the Cantor Lane plan. Then with our packet, um, <clears throat> we had a letter from Peter Rand regarding Cantor Lane, a letter from S. Harmon regarding Dominicans Crossing, Environment and Development Newsletter January and February of 96, DEP Freshwater Wetland Information Sheet, a Keynotes article, workshop conference announcements, Letter from the CMP regarding Dominicus Crossing. Letter from Frank Strutt regarding Cantor Lane Project. Notice of BMPs, technical assistance activities, and BMPs are better management practices. And letter from town attorney regarding due process requirements. And the first um, item under all business is the Cantor Lane Project. And as in the past, I have to step down for this particular item. Ms. McKay, would you step mm -hmm. to the fourth
First off, I'd like to state for the record that I was uh, present at the January regular meeting of the Planning Board at which the application was deemed complete. I was absent from the Planning Board meeting in February, the regular meeting uh, at which the public hearing was held. However, I have reviewed the um, documents that were submitted for that meeting and also the um, minutes of the meeting and did attend the site walk in on March the 2nd. So, um, would the applicant like to try make an introduction or show? Yes. <coughs> Does the applicant want to make a presentation at this point? Could you state your name for the record? Good evening. I'm Bob Metcalf with Mitchell & Associates. Uh, John Mitchell was unable to attend tonight, so I'm here in his place. Uh, partly due to uh, some information that we obtained today, uh, there seemed to be some miscommunication initially with our submission uh, regarding some comments made by the town planner and the town engineer for the 20th meeting that you just mentioned, which was the last meeting. We had submitted revised plans to a copy to both Maureen and also to T.Y. Lynn addressing those respective comments. Uh, again, I don't know if it was miscommunication, but the plans were not submitted for your review uh, as far as we're making judgment on. The letter that you received on March 1st was based on all the previous work plus the comments we addressed on that uh, submission of February 16th. Uh, what I'd like to do, obviously you haven't had the plans to review, uh, but the comments made by the town engineer as well as the town planner were open as part of tonight's meeting. And I'd like to uh, indulge upon you <coughs> respond to those particular items uh, and then we would Resubmit the plans for your review and for the town engineer's full comments and Maureen's full comments and request to uh, be heard again on the 16th of uh, April at your next regular scheduled meeting. Uh, if you have no problems with that, I'll address those items if you'd like. I certainly don't have any problem with that. Okay. I don't know if you all have copies of Mr. Warren's letter or not in package tonight, but it was part of your original submission. Um, this is in accordance to Mr. Warren's letter of February 12, 1996. There was an uh, issue. The first item was site distances. The first one, there was no uh, requirement response for the met the requirements for site distance on Ocean House Road. The second me, uh, Mr. Sure. Metcalf, before I, I think everybody's sort of fishing for this. This sure. is the February the 12th letter that was attached to the February 20th memo last uh, last time around. It's about it, it was attachment one to that memo, and it looks like it's about a four-page letter. It's confusing because the second, third, and fourth pages of the letter refer to the date as February the 9th, but the first page refers to it as February the 12th. We got it? Excuse me, Ms. Metcalf, sure. right ahead. No problem. Uh, again, the first item was uh, discussions on site distance. Uh, A, there was no response required because we had met the required information for the site distance on Ocean House Road. Item B uh, made reference to site distances on Cantor Lane itself due to the vegetative <coughs> cover. Uh, as we explained in our letter to Mr. Morin, the Graphics on the plan show the canopy structure of the trees that overhang Canter Lane. The trunks of the trees are back outside of that right-of-way area of the existing Canter Lane, and the sight lines were based on that. Uh, part of uh, Mr. Warren's comments uh, was that in the event there is obstruction after the road were to be constructed, that measures be taken during the spring to clear any understory vegetation. Uh, we agreed on that and have added a note to the drawing uh, as number 12, stating that in the spring, once the road is constructed, that any necessary clearing that has to meet the 200-foot sight line distance in either direction would be applied. Uh, item 2 uh, made references to intersection radii. Uh, the first one, item A, was making reference to the required 20-foot uh, radius at the intersection of Canter Lane and Ocean House Road. Uh, the existing radii are 15 feet. Uh, our response to Mr. Morin was that the drive throat is exceptionally wide, is 36 feet wide, and tapers back to the stone wall entrance going in, and that uh, there is more than adequate 
uh, turning movement for even emergency vehicles as well as uh, automobiles to enter uh, and exit the site and request not to change the already I from 15 to 20 at that location. Let's see. The other comment on Ready I was uh, on Lot 5 for the driveway access serving Lot 5. Uh, the Ready I had inadvertently left off the plan. That has been since revised, showing uh, a 20 foot radius and a 15 foot radius, respectively, on the incoming side and the outgoing side of that driveway. That information has been added to Sheet 2 of the plans. Item 3 was in regards to utilities. Uh, Mr. Warren was looking for a location of the utility poles that would service this project. Uh, we contacted CMP. Uh, they gave us some preliminary ideas and locations. Those have been added to Sheet 2. Subsequent to that, they have provided us with a sketch plan of where they would assume utility poles have to be located to service both lots 4 and 5. Uh, we have the initial locations on the plan. We will revise that accordingly to show CMP's new locations for those utility poles. Uh, regarding location of existing wells and subsurface waste disposal sites, uh, lot 2 has been indicated on sheet 1. At the time we submitted the plans earlier for lot 3, Mr. Pond was out of, out of town, uh, actually was out of the state. Uh, we were unable to get information on his particular property, uh, but at the time we submitted this, we felt as though the location of his property in conjunction with the road is being proposed is far enough away that there would be no impact on his property nor that it wasn't warranted in providing that information. Uh, let's see. Item 4, existing with the Cantor Lane. Mr. Moran uh, asked that we note on the plan that Cantor Lane, in addition to his 12 feet of width, has two foot gravel shoulders on either side, which it does. We have added that information to the drawing. Uh, item 5, on the detail sheet, uh, it requested some additional information on several of the details. Item A, on the riprap detail, uh, he asked to have the depth of the stone indicated on the drawing. Those have been done. Item B, uh, there was a mistyped note on the silt fence. It showed on the downslope side of the support stakes that has been revised to read the upslope side of the support stakes. Item C, uh, regarded having additional dimensional requirements added on the dry hydrant that is proposed, that information has been added to sheet two. In addition, he had requested that crushed stone be added around the well screen end of the dry hydrant within the pond. That detail has been revised. <coughs> Item six, talked about grading and drainage. Uh, there was an issue of, uh, he could not interpret the grading at the turnaround. Basically, it uh, was a poor print that had come through. Uh, we revised that to highlight the grades on there. The grades were there, they just didn't read as well. That has been corrected on sheet two. Uh, item B, uh, it regards issues of ponding at the outlet of both of the proposed culverts underneath the proposed access road. Our feeling is, is that uh, based on the fact that they fall out into the wetland area, that we did not want to involve any further disturbance at the end of those to change the grades. That the volume of water coming through there, once they reach a hydro hydrologic head, they will move out into the wetland. There will be no ponding back up into the roadway bed itself and there shouldn't be any major impact at all. And we are, in addition to that, uh, one of the, the furthest one down, closest to lot five, uh, we feel the same way on that, but we're willing to look at that once it was constructed, if it required any in the field adjustments, we would coordinate that with the code enforcement officer and the planning department to verify any changes that might be required of that. But at this point, we do not want to make any additional impacts in the wetland area. Let's see. Uh, item seven, subsurface waste disposal. Uh, the first comment, there was no response required. Uh, the second item, B, uh, five test pit locations for each disposal area have been indicated and shown on sheet one as requested. Item eight, soils data. We had sent Mr. Moore on a copy of the soil survey sheet that was done by with alternatives and their field assessment and I'm delineating the wetlands. Uh, he had indicated he had a poor quality. We sent him another copy, but indicated also that these are field data sheets. They're done in the field and not typewritten. They're handwritten in the field. And we had gave him the best legible copy that we had as far as indicating that information. And that covers 
the items in Mr. Warren's letter. In regard to comments from the town planner, uh, which were dated from your memo of the last meeting, item one uh, discussed revisions to note number 10 on sheet two. Uh, we have revised note 10 to address lot owner's responsibility for the maintenance of the access drive and that the 12-foot minimum vertical clearance along the access drive shall be maintained. That was a requested note through Maureen to add to the plan that has been done. Uh, item 2 regarding lot 5 driveway. Note 11 has been added to the general notes as well as a plan reference noting on sheet 2 regarding the pro proposed driveway for lot 5. It was requested to add a note that would signify that the location as shown on the plan and designated on the plan is where the driveway for lot 5 has to occur. And that has been done. Uh, item three, access driveway name. The applicant agrees to meet with Maureen and the fire chief to come up with a name that is not similar to any other road name in town. And I can appreciate that working on the planning board in Kennebunk. We've had that same problem a number of times with it, too similar. Uh, he is willing to sit down and work out a name that will be appropriate. Uh, item four, water supply. Uh, as far as fire protection, uh, we, the applicant believes that the dry hydrant as proposed is adequate to service the site uh, requirements. Uh, there may have been some misunderstanding in terms of the requirements for that dry hydrant where it was stated that the water would be from both ponds. The dry hydrant requirement was sized on the first pond on the right hand side of Cantor Lane as you come in. The second pond is only supplemental. All the water requirements were based on calculations performed on that one pond to service the site. And that's where the calculations have come from. Uh, item five regarding septic systems, there was no response required. And again, uh, item six in regards to utility poles also as far as location, as I said earlier, we have received updated information from Central Maine Power and that information will be added to the plans for your review. <coughs> Some additional comments that were raised, I believe it was by the Conservation Commission, was concerning, and I believe the Planning Board also raised these issues, is in regards to the, the buffer area around the vertical pool, as well as the building window on lot one. And I believe you may have a small 8.5 by 11 copy in, the, in your packet. The buffer around the vertical pool has been expanded. The area in this lower corner of the site virtually is unbuildable in terms of it doesn't make sense to build anything in that location anyway, so the buffer has been extended around it a tie into the side setback line. And the buffer has been extended on this side of the pond as a vernal pool as well. And in regards to a comment on the building window on lot number one, there was a little tail building window that came out in this area and here that has been squared off in this location. Again, to go back to the letter of March 1st, uh, this letter was really based upon all the previous work the applicant has presented to the board uh, based on your comments and discussions. Uh, it had also been predicated on the fact that the submission of what we thought of, January, of uh, February 16th, which addressed the comments that I just went over, were going to be part of your review this evening. Uh, and that's why we were looking for a decision this evening. Uh, considering the fact that you haven't had an opportunity to review those and the town engineer has not fully reviewed the plans, uh, we would request that uh, if you have, we would resubmit the plans in a timely fashion 18 days prior to your next meeting in order that you can have adequate time to have those reviewed and for you to review them and your consultant's comments. And, uh, we'll have a decision rendered on the 16th of April. If you have any additional questions for me, I'll be happy to respond to those. Thank you, Mr. Petcalf. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Emery? Uh, Madam Chairman, Chairperson, Chair, I'm sorry. Uh, it's difficult. Isn't if it? I were, if I, I was a chair, you are a chair, and all future people will be chairs. Um, 
just a uh, point of disclosure, John Mitchell and I were college roommates. Um, that has never prejudiced uh, either in favor or against any presentation that he's made before this board while I've been sitting on it. Mr. Metcalf uh, was a former member of Terrian Architects, and we worked hand in hand. Uh, Bob has been with John Mitchell's office for the last five years. I'm no longer with Terrian Architects, uh, and uh, I feel very capable of, of giving this impartial uh, review, even in Bob's uh, wonderful presence. Uh, as I told John Mitchell, uh, I was not present at the workshop meeting, and I continue to regret uh, that I was not. I think, uh, as it appears as though this may be tabled to another meeting, I, I would like to, to put on the record, based on the information that uh, we have to date, and particularly based on the site walk, um, that I'm, that, that first of all, that the board is, is not being asked to review the subdivision, that the subdivision was created by a prior owner, uh, is that the uh, a legal subdivision under, uh, although it was not reviewed by the planning board, uh, and is duly signed and recorded in the Registry of Deeds. Uh, within that approved subdivision, however, there's a 40-foot right-of-way to provide access to the rear, rear lots. Uh, part of that right-of-way has been disrupted by the pond that was constructed by one of the current uh, uh, butters. Uh, in addition, part of that right-of-way has also been cleared of trees. Um, my statement, I believe, at the last meeting and my, my uh, sensibilities continue to be that uh, my preference would be, given the size of the property that we're looking at, that an upland location be found uh, for the new access road. Uh, as a planning board member, I feel as though I'm a, a co-conspirator to avoid the wetland rules by, uh, uh, particularly when this much land is available, to find the first course of access is to be through the uh, uh, through wetlands. However, I'm taking at face value the fact that the applicant has before us a, 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 an existing subdivision. Uh, therefore, uh, I would like to either be on one side of the fence or the other. And if we are not to get into review of the subdivision, which we are not, I would prefer that we take the application at face value. That is that the applicant bring before us the uh, road as it was, uh, was recorded in the, or the access that was recorded in the uh, registry of deeds with minor relocation of the access drive is necessary to get around the pond. Um, and I, I would uh, at least feel in conscious that I could justify the wetland alteration permit in that the, uh, the plan was filed in 1986 prior to at least the popular adoption of uh, federal wet wetland uh, standards. As it is now, I feel compelled, uh, particularly after the site walk, to feel that there's a better location uh, for the road, albeit that it would impact the developability of Lot 1. To what extent, it's not really clear. It depends on how large a lot and how big a house uh, one wants to accommodate on Lot 1. Uh, my sense is that, that there's plenty of room on the site overall to accommodate uh, the number of houses that are being proposed and also to provide an upland access uh, route uh, to those houses. Uh, so at that point, uh, that, that's where I rest with respect to this uh, application. Thank you, Mr. Emery. Does any other board member have any comments? Mr. Edsel. Um, I really have two um, areas of, of um, questioning. Um, and one of those is back to the, the, the vernal pool, and, and primarily the, the septic system that's proposed for that. I, I look at, and, and last month we talked about the requirement of that septic system to be downgrade, and there was no upgrade in the uh, septic system. I looked at the design of that, and I realized it's, it's simply designed for design purposes. Um, but I, what I want to make sure is that a requirement or a condition of, of approving that septic system is that in its design it doesn't raise it above gradient simply because at the elevation, in other words, if we can add a condition to the plan that simply says that the top of the chamber level uh, must be a minimum of one foot below gradient of the surface of the vernal pool, it sort of guarantees that we don't have any uh, backflow uh, of any leaking septic system. Um, I would. I look at that because I, I see that your, your proposed 
um, chamber bed, which most of them are, are simply set on top of the existing grade, uh, raising it anywhere four or five feet or so, in this case close to five feet. Um, so even though it sits on the same elevation, it, 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 it has to be some damming that's created by that, that leach field back into the rental pool area. Um, and I'm not sure how the wording would go, but I, I would ask for some consensus on the board that uh, some type of wording, whether it's on the plan or condition of, of the building permit for that lot, include uh, something to say that the top of the chambers must be a minimum one feet below gradient of the surface of the vernal pool. Um, and I guess that's enough uh, said uh, regarding that, that one septic system. The other deals with the, the dry hydrant assist, uh, situation. It was unclear from your March 1 letter whether the, it, it sounded like the applicant wasn't willing to comply with the chief's criteria for dry hydrant, but I didn't, I don't have the dates of those actually. Um, Phil McGoldrick's letters as of the 12th. If I can respond to that, sure. we did not have that letter yes, at when, that first, when the March 1st letter was written. Do you see anything um, that would not be uh, acceptable to the applicant? Basically, it's just some additional details that need to go on. The detail is shown in the package. Pretty much it was designed to those standards. Okay. The NFPA 1231 requirements. All right. Is the applicant willing to, it, it states that all homes should be equipped with uh, Pamphlet 13D sprinkler systems, is that, that that hasn't been acceptable in the past. Is there a change on the applicant's part? As I understand from the Fire Chief's response, it's one of three items that he would accept, and our stand is still to go with the dry hydrant and not I understand. the fire sprinklers. In the Good. Okay. I read that incorrectly. Um, the question on the pond, did, did you, or are you familiar with the calculations of the, of the, uh, the volume of the pond? Yes. Can you... Just, I, I try to do it graphically and mathematically, and, and, and the assumption that it, it has an average uh, depth of eight feet just simply doesn't make sense unless the pond is constructed with some type of uh, uh, abutment inside the, the chamber to it. It's basically taking the gradient side slopes of the pond. Mm -hmm. that we had an information based on the, the surface level elevation. We deducted several feet off of that for drought conditions and then calculated the internal volume of the pond area to come up with the total water volume. What's the total volume in gallons? Uh, I don't have that with me, I apologize. But it was in excess of one acre foot, which is 43,560 cubic feet. And that's at a full level? That is based two feet below existing pond level that it supposed would be at at full capacity. Okay. So I, I, I take it that the applicant is going to choose um, alternative three, and so that you have to somehow show 30,000 gallon capacity at drought condition. What's, yeah. the, what's the criteria for drought condition? Basically, that pond being two feet below surface elevation would take it down below the outlet end mm -hmm. of the pond. Okay. Um, When John was here last month, um, there was a question regarding whether it's a Tier 1 or Tier 2 um, review by the DEP. Yes. And with the widening of ro the road from the original plan, does this push this into a Tier 2? It just stays under. just stays under. Does, is uh, Vernal Pool a qualifying habitat for the, the DEP? Based on present standards and regulations for the DEP, this vernal pool does not fall under their jurisdiction. Uh, Inland Fish and Wildlife has identified certain vernal pools in the state. If they show up in an Inland Fish and Wildlife map, then they do fall under jurisdiction. Uh, they are in the process of trying to work some sort of legislation out to, to address vernal pools, but that is not in place at this point. Okay, that's it for right now. Any other board member have any comments? Mr. Wilcox. Um, Mr. Metcalf, the um, elevation of the top of pond in the detail, is that the drought elevation? Yes. Okay. Um, 
In terms of the, the volume of the pond, then, uh, would it be possible for you to provide some information on what the side slopes of the pond are? We can work on that, yes. Just to kind of show graphically sure. mm -hmm. how that was arrived at. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Emery. Uh, one follow-up uh, question. I believe in, in uh, the letter there's a reference to public access that the applicant is willing to... Um, are you referencing the March 1st letter? I'm referencing the March 1st letter from Mitchell and Associates on the second page in the public access. Uh, the applicant uh, states that with favorable decision on this application, the applicants are willing to negotiate and grant a public access easement with the town or land trust that is fair to the future residents and public users. Um, it, it's introduced, uh, however, by saying that the applicant recognize and appreciate the importance of public access however, believe that it should not be mandatory as part of this application process. Um, I would uh, suggest that given the, if we take the applicant's approach, um, you know, there's nothing warmer than an, uh, than an approval in hand and there's not a lot of uh, impetus to negotiate thereafter. Uh, that, um, and on the other hand, an applicant doesn't want to give up the farm uh, only to be denied a, a permit. Um, it would seem reasonable that uh, with the appropriate parties that the applicant could come to some agreement in principle that would also uh, be presented to the planning board uh, as evidence of the good faith uh, negotiations. Um, and that should be part of, of the application prior to approval. Uh, and I state that somewhat out of, out of the correspondence and public comments that we've received about the, uh, the, the uh, tradition of the uh, joining properties and the, and the long access and generous access that the abutters have provided to uh, many of the town's uh, people, including uh, some of our athletic teams. Any further comment from other board members? Mr. Edsel. Uh, perhaps I missed it in, in the different dating of all these uh, memos and so forth, but has the applicant been willing to um, provide a deeded pedestrian easement um, I guess on, on lot four or uh, five or one? Not at this time. Uh, according to what Mr. Emmer is referencing, we have stated in the letter that he would be willing after approval for the project of sitting down and negotiating with the land trust okay. or the town, whichever body required. Uh, to work out some sort of public access across the property that would be acceptable to the new residents that would be there as well as the town. I guess I, I don't understand the reasoning behind that. Um, uh, and I guess I'm sorry I missed Tom's uh, full impact of what you're, you're, you're applying that implying. Maybe it's because I reversed the sentence. <laughs> Maybe that's a little slow on I tried following. to cover it as smoothly as possible. But you know how clumsy I am. It usually but. works in writing, you know, if you start in the middle and go back. Yeah. I, I guess it just, uh, why, aren't, why isn't the applicant, is it the applicant uh, Shore Woods or, or Sagamon Associates that's not willing to sit down prior to, to approval? Yeah, all the applicants. Are. Applicants. I guess I have a real hard time with that, um, not understanding why they need to wait till after uh, uh, approval, assuming approval, I guess. Um. The position of the applicant is that it's not part of this process as far as the public access way or the wetlands impact uh, permit request uh, and should not be made part of this application. Uh, it is his property, and to paraphrase Mr. Emery, not give up the farm. Uh, it is not a requirement. Uh, to provide public access uh, and therefore does not want it to be part of a condition of this plan, but is willing to work with the town of the land trust after such time as he has an understanding that he can put in this access way uh, to service these. I understand that. I guess I understand that. But if, at the same time, um, I mean, if we, there are a lot of things, every applicant that, that comes before us, we sometimes ask them for things that aren't necessarily required in the ordinance. I understand. In the um, in the uh, tone that we ask in situations of a, a subdivider, uh, investor, developer uh, makes a contribution and becomes a part of this community, 
that they just don't take from it all, that they give some back. Um, and, and that's what we're looking for. I'm one planning board member at this point in time. Uh, I don't think I'm willing to wait until afterwards to, to make that decision. I, I'll have to think about that. Um, but I think you need to communicate that. I, you know, we're looking, the next agenda item is a, is a 94 lot subdivision. We're asking them to, to be a part of this community in, in their application. And, and they probably will provide some things that they just don't need to do by law. And I, in the same way, we're asking this applicant or applicants to do the same thing. I understand. I can present it to the clients and uh, you. can address it that way. Mr. Petcalf, I have a couple of comments I'd like to state for the record that I share the concerns expressed by Mr. Emery and Mr. Edsel with respect to the pedestrian access, and I also share Mr. Emery's concern about the placement of the road um, and his expressed comments I echo. I'd like to know whether there are, or whether you would like to respond in any way to the other items that were expressed in the Conservation Commission's letter of February the 20th. I think you have addressed uh, item number five in that letter, which is the portion east of the Vernal Pool. But I didn't notice any particular response to any of the other concerns and wanted to know if you wanted to address those. Uh, basically, in terms of shifting the access road, uh, we feel as though it has been moved to a suitable place uh, it has been adjusted to move it to the upper limits of the wetland, uh, that it would be uh, more of an impact to the development of Lot 1. Uh, there are also some significant oak trees uh, as well in the upland area where the road would have to go in response to one of the arguments that there would be significant trees in the wetland altered. Uh, the feeling of the applicant is, in terms of the quality of what he's trying to achieve in a neighborhood with the addition of these lots, uh, warrants keeping the road where it is being located and does not plan to move it. Thank you, sir. Anybody else have any comments? Okay, do I, I understand from the applicant that he is uh, requesting that the planning board table this application until the next meeting and I wonder if I might have a motion to that effect in this. If, if I may ask. Sure. Just one, I'll ask this, uh, as I said on my own planning board in Kenny Bunk, it's a process that goes on there sometimes, uh, that we accept. Uh, I would ask for a polling of the board in terms of uh, what the board's position is on this application at this point. Uh, I'm not sure we accept that in Cape Elizabeth. I don't okay, think I've, uh, I am <laughs> I've never question. participated in that before. So, Is there a sense of the board in terms of that comment, Mr. Emery? I think that's always a fair question. Um, I, I guess the consequences are that until all of the uh, evidence is before the uh, board that uh, it's, it's not uh, always a good idea to indicate any preference uh, in terms of prejudicing the uh, final outcome. Um, it's not unusual, as you know, being a planning board member, that planning boards uh, s are uh, very much uh, <laughs> a question about how they're going to vote on an issue and can decide at the very instant that they're asked to a vote uh, that the evidence is so even in either case. Uh, from my own standpoint, however, I, I think I've made it clear what my position is. Um, and, and again, I'll reinforce that from the standpoint that the, this board or, or town board was not afforded the opportunity to review the subdivision plan, and yet we're being asked to, in essence, make it workable. Um, so I'm not, I'm not at all adverse to looking at the original subdivision as it is with a, with a public access and wetland alteration permit. Um, but uh, I'm not able to, uh, I think, become sort of a co-conspirator with, with going through a wetland when there's, there's apparently plenty of upland area to, to build in first. Anybody else want to weigh in on the process itself? I, I just short time ago stated my one objection and, and that will stand uh, in the way of my looking favorable upon it until uh, they want to come to the table and talk. Yes. For the benefit of the applicant, uh, as one member, I could not be in support of this project uh, due to the lack of public access to the existing trail system behind the property uh, and also the present location of the road.
Anybody else? Uh, I would add the, um, to my earlier comments, uh, I do have a concern about the capacity for firefighting and public safety. Uh, if the pond does slope in on the sides, it appears just at a thumbnail sketch level to provide significantly less than what the fire chief is looking for. Uh, I'm also concerned about the alteration of uh, the existing trail system and the fact that the ordinance uh, allows the board when this number of lots are involved in a public access waiver to use subdivision road standards. I know nobody on this board wants to use subdivision road standards, but I think the intent is when you create a neighborhood, you create a, you create the municipal infrastructure to service that neighborhood also. And while we're willing to waive many things in the interest of environmental impact, uh, I think this application kind of pushes very close to going over the edge here. And I don't think I'd be able to support the application unless the public realm <coughs> here is a little bit more well served by the application. Well, I think the uh, the applicant or his representative probably got a pretty good feel for how the board feels. And I, I'm just kind of a little bit surprised because this was kind of brought up in the previous meeting. And we still don't get the satisfaction of the of the easements and trails. That was pretty much early in the game was, was discussed. And we seem to be saying, I'm kind of hearing that, uh, well, this is the way we're going to do it. And uh, that's it. But we do have a, a, a kind of a um, feeling for the community, and we would hope that it would be a two-way street, and the applicant might uh, come across what his plans really are for these easements, and also for the public to learn exactly what he has in, has in mind. I think you have a pretty good idea of how the board feels right now, but I don't think it can be... A, I think it can be easily overcome. That can very easily overcome. So uh, I'll leave it with that. Thank you. I think I've made my uh, <laughs> statement earlier. So I do have a particular concern about the trail system and the, and the location of the road. So um, I take it you got what you asked for. Yes, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> Not exactly what you were looking well, for, but uh, you got an answer. Uh, okay, Ms. Grammer. Madam Chair, I'd just like to add, uh, although it was read in, into the uh, um, minutes, uh, the existing correspondence, we did receive several letters from uh, Butters uh, and from uh, Dr. Rand with respect to the project, and they were very thoughtful, carefully drafted letters, and uh, I, as one member, appreciate the time that the uh, Butters and Dr. Rand put into putting those letters together. Thank you for saying that. I also was very appreciative of the quality of the correspondence. So, hearing nothing further in the way of a discussion, Mr. Edsel? I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented, the request of Shore Woods Inc., Sagamon Associates Inc., and Canna Corp. for a wetland alteration permit and public access waiver lots 1, 2, 4, and 5 located off Canna Lane be tabled to the regular. April 16, 1996, meeting of the planning board. Is there a second? Second. Well, folks, I'd like to suggest, uh, Mr. Edsel, that we add at the very end of what you've proposed with the consent of the applicant or at the request of the applicant. Sure. The, I, I guess it's continued by mutual consent, and uh, they requested, and, and we're voting. So. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt any to, to state that. Okay. Mr. Wilcox, you accept that as the modification? Yes, I amend my motion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous? Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you.
Item on the agenda, uh, Dominicus Crossing Subdivision request by Dominicus Crossing Limited Li Liability Company for preliminary subdivision approval and a wetlands alteration permit for a 97 plus lot subdivision located off Wells and Sawyer Roads, section 16-2-4 major subdivision and section 19-3-9 wetland alteration permit. This will also be a public hearing. Maureen, would you like to make an introduction? Certainly. Mr. Chair, before, I, uh, before you begin, I'd like to state something for the record, if I can. I was not here at the uh, February meeting, and in reviewing the minutes for Dominicus Crossing, I noted that a man named Bob Stevens had spoken on behalf of the developer. Uh, I'm affiliated with a law firm that has Bob Stevens in it, but I understand this was not that Bob Stevens. The Bob Stevens that spoke was a broker. Is that correct? That is correct. I just want, wanted to make sure that uh, <laughs> we weren't going to have any difficulties down the line. Thank you. Um, this is a 97-plus slot subdivision, and, and that, that's a little vague because there's some multi-units and there's some changes in the number of lots, I think, um, in the offing. Uh, but this is, this is located off of Wells Road and Sawyer Road. It's a 200-plus acre tract. Uh, the application has been um, heard by the planning board. It was deemed complete at the last meeting, uh, and a public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. Uh, the board had also scheduled a workshop for the beginning of this month uh, where the applicant had hoped to unveil some new conceptual drawings to address some concerns raised by the board. Uh, because that workshop was scheduled, the applicant has included some of those conceptual drawings in, in the, the presentation for this evening, but they have not yet submitted final drawings waiting for the board's comments, so hopefully that won't, be any, won't lead to any confusion. Are there any questions? I just verify that the uh, workshop was canceled. It was snowed out. Weather, as opposed to scheduled. Yes, it was canceled due to snow. <coughs> hey, would the applicant like to make a brief introduction before we begin the public hearing? I really don't have anything more to add to what Marine's already um, mentioned, um, other than the fact that we did submit a package of information with a series of, sec of six, eight and a half, by eleven sketches that summarize the changes that we did want to have the night that it did get snowed out. Um, and we're in a kind of an awkward position here because we do have a, an application that has been deemed complete before the board. However, in the course of events, uh, in terms of talking with the planning board, uh, with Maureen and other members of the town staff, hearing concerns and comments from the neighbors, talking with DEP, talking with CMP, and other parties, we felt that it was appropriate at this point to start to bring before the, the planning board a number of these changes. And I think that, um, I hope that you'll be very happy to see some of the directions that we're taking the plan because they do reflect on a lot of the concerns and comments that we did hear by the planning board the last time. So in making the presentation for the public hearing, we will be talking about the overall plan, but we will, we will be talking about very specific changes that have been made which we feel have uh, greatly improved the, the livability of the project. Any board members make to, uh, would like to make any sort of comments before we open the public hearing? No. Okay, the public hearing is open. Um, members of the public who wish to speak, please come to the podium, say your name and address, and speak briefly. Members of the Planning Board, my name is John Bannon. I'm an attorney and I represent uh, Ellen Muger and Bob Clements, who are in the audience today, and I believe they'd like to speak themselves. Um, the Muger and Clements residence is located right here on these plans. Um, and as you can 
yes, uh, the, Ms. Huger and Mr. Clements are very, very, very concerned about the impact of this uh, very large project on them in particular. This is one of the only residences that's in, in truly close proximity to the most highly developed part of the project. And they're somewhat frustrated at the way uh, their concerns have been met by the developer. Uh, they were previously represented by an attorney named Ron Ward who attempted to work with the developer to get some sort of concessions or additional offering for their house from all of these units. Um, and uh, got some concessions, but not anything really satisfactory. Um, I was uh, hired in January of this year and wrote to the developer on January 12th asking if there was some way that we could come to some further accommodation uh, with regard to protecting uh, my client's privacy. I heard nothing from the developer until today, and I do appreciate that Terry Dewan did go to the trouble of calling me today, but uh, that's not a very good response time, and it frustrates, uh, I think, everyone's review of this project not to have a more prompt dialogue going on between the developer and the abutters. Um, this project, I think, it raised an important distinction, and it's a distinction that I would call between good faith clustering and cynical clustering. Good faith clustering, in my mind, means that a developer uh, looks at a particular site, uh, finds natural features and so forth that he or she could otherwise have developed uh, in terms of their own benefit, and then makes a voluntary decision uh, to preserve those uh, for the public in exchange for some sort of concessions from the town through density bonuses. And that's what I call good faith clustering where a developer takes something that's valuable to him or her, uh, decides to keep it safe, and in return gets something from the town. Cynical clustering is when a developer uh, finds the parts of his or her property that he can't use anyway, uh, attempts to turn those into open space, and attempts to bargain those uh, uh, in favor of uh, density bonuses from a town. And it's my contention that that is exactly, unfortunately, what's happening in this case. And that, that this subdivision does not uh, meet the spirit or the letter of cluster zoning. All this is, essentially, is an effort to maximize the development potential of this site without giving the public anything it doesn't already have. These are very uh, elaborate drawings. Uh, and they make the project look uh, quite spiffy. And I'm sure that I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. But I wanted to point something out with regard to what I call cynical clustering. What I did today was I went into the planning board office and got a copy of the uh, plan. And on that plan are delineated the wetlands. The, the applicant did that themselves. I didn't do this. There are little dotted lines that you could connect just as easily as I could. The wetlands are shown in uh, dark blue, and the pink areas are the uh, critical wetland buffers as drawn by the applicant and in, in their application. Uh, I just used the information that they took. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to uh, go from that plan to this one and reach the conclusion that the basis for designing this subdivision was just to avoid the wetland. It uh, has to be uh, more than a coincidence that this open space, very large open space, is basically exactly the same size as this RP1 wetland plus its critical buffer. Outside of the wetlands and the buffer, we have one of the more intense parts of the subdivision. In back of the wetlands, we have another large portion of the project. We have another large wetlands area, and then Tucked up in here, um, the board seems to be having some trouble seeing and realize, realize there are a lot of plans here. Um, but, but what we're seeing here is that the limitations on the site are what's designing it, not the planners, not the, not the developers. Um, and that is what 
I call cynical cluster zoning. I'd like to hand out to the board a, a little sort of executive summary of some of the concerns that I have about the project. is that the developers are trying to get a density bonus in exchange for their creation of green space. But all this green space is, is land they couldn't use anyway. The CMP easement, which is uh, indicated here, uh, is a typical CMP easement that prevents uh, development beneath it. So what are they giving up? Nothing in that case. That is something that the developer couldn't use. Secondly, the resource protection on wetlands and critical wetland buffers. These areas here, which are transformed into uh, magical open space, uh, under the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, you couldn't fill those lands anyway. You couldn't build on those properties, uh, on that land. The developer isn't giving up anything. He is simply agreeing to abide by the law, which forbids him from developing that land anyway. Third, uh, resource protection to wetlands are being dedicated or included within this 100-acre gift. The odds of the DEP or this town or the Army Corps allowing development of resource protection to wetlands is likewise virtually non-existent. Again, it's property that the developer couldn't have used anyway uh, in which he is now giving uh, to the town. There are two other areas that the uh, developer purports to be giving to the the town. One of them is buffer zones around abutting property and areas adjacent to roads. I don't know what that in particular refers to, but if that's something that's uh, required by the ordinances uh, or by law, once again, the developer is only agreeing to abide by the law. He's not giving up anything. Uh, he's just doing what any other law-abiding citizen would have to do. And finally, much of the area that is being, uh, quote-unquote, given to the uh, uh, the town are areas of ledge outcroppings and places where there is shallow depth to bedrock or places where there was a bedrock within six inches of the surface. Once again, that area that's unsuitable for development. It's stuff that the developer couldn't use anyway. It's junk land, in a sense. And the developer is trying to trade essentially useless land or land that's useless to him uh, for the benefits of cluster zoning. And I, I contend very strenuously that that is directly contrary to the spirit of the zoning ordinance and cluster zoning. In addition, the developers have miscalculated, pardon me, the net residential acreage for this parcel. And I think that there's just no question about this one. Uh, this isn't a question of interpretation or philosophy. It's a matter of mathematics. Um, I've included on page three the developer's calculation of the net residential acreage. They have. Um, deducted from the net residential acreage only 4.2 acres of land that has bedrock at the surface or within six inches. One of the things I did also today was to go get the soils map. And there's a lot of colors here which I will explain to you. Um, the developer's soil scientist, Al Frick, has said that in 10% of the land group known as Lyman Tunbridge Rock Outcrop Complex. The bedrock will either be at the surface or within six inches. On this map, that rock or that soil complex is the brown pink. The places covered with this Tunbridge uh, Lyman Rock uh, Outcropping Complex. 10% of this is presumably, according to the applicant, unsuitable for development. It can't be 4.2 acres. I mean, that looks to me like approximately two-thirds of this site. And so by my calculations, uh, the deduction has to be, uh, for bedrock alone, more on the order of 13 
or 14 acres just for that uh, segment of the, of the calculation. In addition, the applicants, the soil scientists said that with regard to the Lyman, the plain old Lyman rock outcrop complex, um, which is in gray ink on this map and is located in many different areas, 20% of these areas will have bedrock within six inches of the surface. Now, I don't have the technical capacity to go out and calculate what the acreage is on these uh, areas of uh, lime and rock outcropping. I'm just not that kind of a professional. But that's certainly additional area that had to be take, or has to be taken into account in determining that residential acres. Um, all that this board has in front of it right now is an estimate from the developers, soil scientists, that uh, in the case of the brown uh, soil type, 10% of that will have uh, bedrock problems. And in the case of the gray soil top, 20% will. Uh, the board has a right to know the answer to that question before it determines whether the developer has actually calculated this uh, net residential acreage correctly. And the most obvious error that the developer has made is in his treatment of uh, saturated soil. Uh, they have deducted 15.3 acres of RP1 wetlands, but other places in their application they have stated that there are 43.7 acres of wetlands on this site. By definition, and by the, the jurisdictional method, well, let me step back. Sounds like at least a number of members of this board know exactly how wetlands are uh, delineated, so I'm not going to uh, insult your intelligence. Obviously, a, a jurisdictional wetland has to at least have had hydric soils in it and wetlands hydrology, so that all of the wetlands on this site should have been included as areas with the water table at the surface for at least part of the year. That should have boosted the, the deduction from 15.3 acres at least to the total of 43.7 acres, which is the total amount of wetlands. If you add up uh, the uh, uh, portions of this property that should have been deducted uh, from the net residential uh, acreage, you come down not to 163.96 acres as the developer calculated, but somewhere is around 125 acres, which would allow under only 82 units. And so under, uh, in the way that this project is presently proposed, it cannot possibly be approved. The developer simply hasn't calculated the net residential acreage properly. Now, uh, Bob Clements uh, is here to talk about his personal views of, of living next to uh, a project of this size. And uh, with his permission, I'll allow him to do it, because I think that, that you need to hear it from his perspective. He's the man who's going to be living there. But from, uh, I guess, a land professional's standpoint, um, this is a project that is being driven by its limitations, not by anyone's vision. And this is not the sort of thing that the, the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board ought to be approved. Thank you. I'm Robert Clements. I live at 77 Wells Road. Uh, as an abutter, we've attended every meeting and just to see what's going on. And we have been remaining quiet, as are the rules. And I just want to make it very clear that this silence should not be considered approval. Uh, this is the first chance we've had to speak about it. First of all, 97 houses or 82 houses is simply too many in one place. Uh, I, as John pointed out, I think this has taken advantage of probably a good idea about cluster, you know, cluster development. But um, I guess if, if we wanted to live in this sort of density, we wouldn't have looked at Cape Elizabeth in the first place. We would look for a home in Portland. And uh, I've heard each of you speak about the attraction and the beauty of this site. And I ask you to keep in mind that by building with this sort of density, 
you're going to destroy the very essence of what makes this site attractive and beautiful in the first place. I'd like to point out, you know, the buffer zones, the open areas. Uh, you'll notice that all around this property and next to the other abutters, there is a very nice wide strip, 50 feet wide to 100 feet wide, all with the exception of our property. And at last offer, they have given us 15 feet. And I might mention that took a lot of time and effort and money at our expense to get them to give us 15 feet and some evergreens. Uh, the offers they are making right now seem to be token, in my opinion, uh, so that they can you know, come here and say, well, we have offered this much. Uh, it's, it's not quite enough. Uh, we're attracted to the site because it was very private. You know, it's open. It fits into all of the literature we've read about, about Cape Elizabeth being, you know, sort of a rural feeling, you know, quiet community. And uh, this, you know, this goes counter to all of that, uh, I guess, reputation of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I guess that's about all I have right now. I could probably go on, but uh, I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Susie Terry in 49 Wells Road. Um, is the abutter who will um, be most negatively affected <clears throat> by the proposed entrance drive to Dominica's Crossing, um, I want to again express my disapproval regarding its placement around my property. I'm simply going to read a paragraph from the letter I wrote January 9th because I, I can't say it any clearer than I already have. My concerns regarding the road's placement on the right-of-way abutting my property are more fundamental than the inevitable problems of decreased air quality and increased noise. Given that, that the developer owns 726 feet of Wells Road, Road frontage on the site of my property where his home is located, frontage on which a perfectly acceptable entrance could be sited, I object to the continuing disregard for my privacy and the blatant intent to disrupt the quality of my life by surrounding me with a road that serves the needs of the development at the expense of my needs. No amount of buffer can effectively mask a road that has been designated by Mr. Perez, traffic consultant, as the major conduit for hundreds of vehicles per day, not to mention construction equipment during a building project estimated by Mr. Anastas to consume six to eight years. This is not a situation in which an unknown landowner owner builds on a site in a way that obscures a view, as unfortunate as that might be. This is a neighbor who, fully aware of my regard for the land in question, Plans a primary road on that land, which, by surrounding me, deflects traffic away for, from his home and the development. This is an issue of fairness. Again, I respectfully request that you withhold approval of the subdivision until the primary entrance is moved to an appropriate location. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Bruce Sarbeck, uh, 15 Silva Drive, um, up in this area right here, as an abutter. Um, I guess I, I'm not overall um, opposed to a project um, in, in, this, in this woods or in this land, because I know someday it's going to have to come. And, um, but I was a little bit surprised initially at the overall size of the project. It started in the 80s, and now it's into the 90s plus, um, whatever the plus means. Um, the reason I'm surprised at this and, and concerned about this is because, again, as a previous uh, speaker said, I don't have a lot of maps and I don't have a lot, a lot of soil analysis and so on, but I have my eyes. I've been on the land, I've been on my land, and I know how much ledge 
is there. You had your site walks earlier on. Um, it was very dry this summer, very dry this fall. Maybe you should go on another site walk this spring and see how much water and how much um, area is not suitable, I feel, for building homes. Um, I have other concerns, um, but basically I think the gentleman previous uh, to my speaking uh, pointed them out. One other thing I'd like to discuss is um, the access road onto Wells Road. Wells Road, I don't know where there's a good site on Wells Road to bring a project of this size into. Um, I don't know where the site distance would be that good. I'm concerned about coming off of a hill onto Wells Road um, because in the winter time there may be some slippery driving and people may slide right out onto Wells Road, another oncoming car, and we may have some problems, especially when there may be 150 cars plus coming out of there. Um, I think the town may consider straightening that road sometime if they want to have a project of this size. And if the town has to consider straightening the road, perhaps maybe um, the contractor or the applicant should be hit with some of the bill to do that. And that brings me to my last contention or my last <coughs> concern. And I, I don't know what the town does with this uh, at all, but I've seen it in other projects in, in the Cape Elizabeth area. And I'm hoping that, that the planning board does put a, so I don't know what you would call it, a bond or whatever, but some sort of an adequate amount of money put aside. So just in case some of these things do not get finished, um, roads, sewer, uh, whatever other projects, or are they is it being built in, in phases? What are we going to do with phase three if phase two doesn't sell, or phase one? Is the road going to have to be continued, or should they put the road all the way through right at the beginning? all the way from Wells Road to Sawyer Road. Um, these are some of my, my uh, few concerns, and um, I hope the board will, uh, will, will look into them. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> my name is Jane Greer. I live at 66 Wells Road. Um, I've lived here for 10 years. After 10 years, of almost daily driving, walking, pushing a stroller, riding or biking on Wells Road, I feel that I'm qualified to comment on my preferred placement for the Wells Road access road. And I must add, I'm the only person who stands every single school day at 8 o'clock and at 3 o'clock at exactly the site of the alternate proposed site because I wait for the school bus every school day at 8 o'clock and 3 o'clock. So I probably know more than the traffic engineer about what happens in that stretch of road and can tell you which of my neighbors speed and which don't. Ms. Graham, would you identify for us on the larger plan exactly where your house is? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm 600 feet off Wells Road, um, diagonal from Warren's house. Mm. Yeah, it's off the map. I'm probably sitting in wetlands and wouldn't be there if I was building today. <laughs> um, based on my years of personal observation of Wells Road traffic in all kinds of weather at all times of the day, um, the entrance is now planned next to the latent property, in my opinion, is the only safe and sensible placement on Wells Road. My second point, I urge you to not micromanage this project. Have faith that the market will vote with its money and that the market will vote with its feet. And as far as I know, there is no law against ugly, but I feel that the market, and here I include the market's desire for restrictive covenants for a subdivision, will ensure an attractive development. And my third and last point is I ask that you examine your vision of affordable housing. A duplex by any other name is a duplex, with all the potential problems inherent in shared living space. I urge the developer to build a few quality, no frills, small square footage, Cape Cod or similar type home to fulfill their affordable housing requirement. I do think they'll be keeping 
with the flavor of the neighborhood, because that's exactly the kind of house that I live in. Um, in conclusion, um, I've known Juan for 10 years. I've been his neighbor for 10 years. I've observed him to be a good steward of his land, and I look forward to that stewardship continuing through the course of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Andy Tabor. I live at 14 Farm Hill Road, and I'm here representing, representing the uh, trustees for the benefit of Troop 30, of which I'm a member. Uh, we are abutters of the land from this point this point here and I just want to bring to the planning board's attention uh, as a part of our boundary line co confirmatory deed that was uh, executed this last year uh, there was a final item added that would include at least 25 feet of access uh, to a development road in close proximity uh, to this land which runs here and here so that we could have access onto a road here from our property. It now looks, originally the road was uh, mapped to come right along this boundary line here, and it looks like it's quite a ways away now. So uh, I'd just like to bring it to the board's attention that we would wonder how that's going to occur. Thank you. John Green, I'm a chairman of the Conservation Commission. Given some of the comments tonight, I imagine we will probably uh, submit further comment. You have some comments uh, submitted somewhat late, uh, given we had a meeting last week. <clears throat> I would like to point out uh, one item uh, regarding trails that we would like to perhaps see some additional work done. Uh, essentially, in this area, uh, the Hinkle property and the town property uh, we would prefer, perhaps, in working with the uh, developer, to uh, come up with some sort of trail system that would access the uh, land trust property here, work its way up through uh, perhaps this neighborhood so that people living in these areas here do not have to, you know, circumvent and walk completely around this area, perhaps uh, something that would connect here. Uh, Perhaps any of these dead end areas, the trail system accessing these areas as well. Um, we would be happy to work with the uh, developer, as stated, um, to achieve uh, some of these goals. Um, as I stated, we would uh, probably have further comment after uh, hearing uh, some of these other people's comments. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Good evening. My name is Walter Hagen. I live at 68 Wells Road, Cape Elizabeth, and I live adjacent to Mrs. Greer. And I'm just uh, going to review a letter that I wrote a little while ago concerning the uh, access road to the property. And I, uh, I write because we learned by letter from uh, Susie Tyrion and also Jane Greer reference the relocation of the Wells Road entrance to the Juan Perez building development based on walking, driving, observation, all daily experiences, turning on to and off of and traveling east and west on both approaches in all kinds of weather should qualify as informing our opinions. I might add that we have considered landscape, site plans, sight lines, traffic flow, pedestrian, car, trucks, and school buses. We share our opinion that the Perez entry exit to the proposed development be located as shown in the past in the present drawings. The present drawings were about October 11, 1995. 
at least the ones we have seen in the planning meetings and to the east of the Tarion property and to the west of the Layton property. I thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? and I live at 77 Wells Road. And I, I'd like to say that wherever the, the drive, the entry is located, there are going to be 900 cars a day coming through new um, uh, vehicles. So I just want you to, or all of you to know that. So all the neighbors, it's going to change things completely. Terry Dewan did say that at one of the meetings, that the whole the neighbor is going to change. And uh, the impact is going to be great. It's going to be great on our schools, on a lot of things. Thank you. Thank you. I am uh, Corey Marcy. I live at 72 Wells Road. And uh, unfortunately, my wife and I got involved in this process a little late. We bought our house about two years ago. And through misinformation, we weren't told about the development, and so here we are. And you know, we bought a house on a beautiful country road, and that's no longer going to happen. Uh, which I understand, uh, but through the two years, or probably since the last year and a half, we've heard about this. The number of houses have gone up, uh, and now all of a sudden we're hearing words like duplexes. Uh, and it, it's all generated by money. It's all driven by money. And I understand that. Uh, the more houses you maximize, the duplex, presumably, will generate even more cash. And I just feel very unfortunate, really, from Chosen Cape. Uh, I don't see why uh, half the houses uh, done correctly couldn't suffice how much, basically, is enough for the developer to make. But it's all generated by money. And I would hope that you would somehow figure out a way to amend, not amend, but realize that the, the beauty of the area is seriously going to be impaired. And presumably that's why you're here to protect that. Thank you. Thank you. Oxley Road. Um, I just wanted to point out that I don't notice that the developer has provided an athletic field to accommodate the uh, us children who will, who will be moving into these houses. And as a taxpayer um, and a citizen, having experienced the difficulty this town already has in accommodating um, more residents and more children than we have uh, facilities for. I think we need to be aware that, that, in my opinion, that the town should be compensated for the uh, cost of improving the schools, the cost of providing additional police protection, and the cost of providing, assuming a place could be found to provide such recreational facilities, the cost that the rest of us will have to occur, incur to accommodate the new residents. Thank you. <clears throat> Does anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Hmm. Oh, any board members wish to lead off here? Some of the um, 
things that were brought up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I would like to start by going over some of the changes that we are proposing right now. And in doing so, I'll try and respond to many of the concerns that we've heard, specifically in uh, terms of the changes that we've made relative to one of the abutters, the need for open space, some of the connections that the Conservation Commission has talked about for trail systems, um, and uh, the use of the duplex mode, um, and the minimization of wetland impacts. And as I mentioned earlier, we did submit um, several, two weeks ago, a package of information that you have in front of you right now, which is on file at Town Hall, outlining the specific changes that are before you right now uh, on my right. And I guess I would just like to go through, starting at the southern end of the property, uh, going north and then to the west, outlining what those changes are. So I do think that they re represent um, a reflection on the comments that we've heard from the planning board, specifically at the, the last time we met. Um, first of all, we were approached by uh, an individual uh, from the Joy Foundation, uh, the owners of some land on the south side of Wells Road. And they had granted an easement uh, to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust in 1988 to provide access to the Spurwink River. And we know that in talking with the, the Conservation Commission, it has been the, the hope that this, the trail systems that have been developed as part of this overall plan could be worked into the overall Greenbelt master plan for the community, as loose or as tight as that may be. And what we're doing now is finding these opportunities, some of which may be on the map. For example, the east-west connector that goes down the power line. We are finding also other opportunities to tie into other pieces of property. Town of property up here, and now the land that the land trust has down to the river. Uh, we are, in order to accommodate that, between the plan that you saw the last time, which is in back of me over here, and this plan, uh, proposing a number of changes. We are showing on this plan that's represented by the sketch before you a, a five-foot pathway. There's probably a wood chip or a gravel pathway, or it's the natural pathway through the woods between a point on Alicia Circle, uh, going in the southerly direction down to Wells Road, at the crest of the hill, which is probably the safest point for a pedestrian to cross, there would be a, uh, a walkway that would des be designated with signs on either side warning of pedestrians on the road that would then allow pedestrians to go down to that public access point down to the Spurwink River. Um, we have not been down all the way. I know it's several hundred feet in length. Uh, we do know that it's there. I don't know the condition of it. We just know that by providing that, it's part of a, an overall pattern of interconnection with neighborhoods and natural resources and open spaces. Um, we are, in terms of doing that, then, we are making some minor adjustments to the lots uh, that are off of Alicia Circle, uh, spreading the lots out by 20 feet or so. They uh, alter that somewhat, enough to get this five-foot-wide pathway through there. That, of course, would be part of the open space uh, system that would be donated to the town. The next point that we've uh, taken into consideration, and you have heard uh, from uh, Alan Mugar, Barbara Clements, John Bannon, concerning the negotiations that we've been having for the last several months uh, on the land uh, that's adjacent to their property, which is their property right here, and Alicia Circle. Uh, in hearing their concerns, we've made a number of uh, concessions over the last several months. Uh, you saw on the application material that we gave you uh, the installation of about 200, um, over 200 feet uh, of white pines or some other evergreen material that we planted to screen the Mugars property uh, from the homes that we built on Alicia Circle. We're also uh, calling for a 15-foot no-cut zone and a 30-foot setback on the back side of the property. Uh, when we redesigned this portion of the property uh, to accommodate some additional open space, it allowed us to uh, do some minor adjustments to the land uh, immediately to the west of the New York property to allow more flexibility of the siting of this house uh, in red right here. These houses, of course, on the plan are just uh, ideas of where houses might be located. There's no guarantee that they would be built in those locations. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we do have additional flexibility in siting a house uh, on the east side of the property. 
Uh, in the prior plan, that's represented this sketch over here, we had two lots as we do now that would have had two probably fairly large single family homes. Uh, when we met uh, with Mugars and the prior attorney, we heard that they uh, were concerned, being uh, uh, rather isolated right now, having to look out on that number of new houses. We felt that uh, one of the things that we might do to reduce the number of structures that they would, they would be looking at would be to take those two single family uh, detached homes and replace them with one of the, uh, the duplex homes that we've been talking about. As you know, we are providing two duplex units for a total of four homes throughout the entire development uh, prior uh, to this sketch. We had duplex units located elsewhere in phase one. We feel that by moving the house in that location, uh, their view uh, will be preserved to a greater extent than the previous plan. We also had heard informal uh, critiques of the initial site, of the initial elevation for the, uh, the so-called uh, low-income affordable home. Uh, before you, and as part of the application package, we've had our architects, Archetype from Portland, take another look at the design of the, the duplex unit. Um, if you were to look at this quickly, I think most people would say that resembles a single-family home. Uh, that's not to say this is the final design. We certainly intend to have continued dialogue with the planning board uh, and people who are most concerned about design on the planning board, but we feel that's an attempt made to uh, replicate an architectural style that may be more fitting to Cape Elizabeth, uh, perhaps in the earlier example was. Uh, this is a single family home on the right, and then a single family home on the left of this diagram. This is a side view looking from the back side of the, the top elevation. There would be an attached garage with a single car garage for each uh, of the units. Um, this would be a, a zero lot line development. Uh, the lot line would go down the center of the, of the home. We still have some issues relative to how the unit itself will be split up. We'll be working those things out with the architect and with our attorneys as we uh, go through this exercise. We do feel, though, that this design uh, will represent a major improvement uh, for the entire development and specifically for people who will be looking at it from the closest distance. Um, the distance in this location um, is 180 feet, I believe, from the Bugar's home. Going uh, up the road from Dominguez Crossing, probably the most um, telling comment that we heard the last time, and I forget who it was that made the, the comment, was wouldn't it be nice if we had a town green somewhat similar to Woodstock, Vermont? If, if, you, if, you, if any of you have been to Woodstock, it's sort of an eyebrow of a town green in the middle of the, the town. It's a lovely scaled space. It's got a, a rail fence around the outside, some commercial, some residential some institutional buildings on the outside of it, several hundred feet in length, maybe 125 feet in width. Um, I couldn't sleep after that last meeting. I went home and started to sketch. Uh, this isn't the final design that, we, that I came up with that night, but in stimulating the imagination, though, we took that as a model. And we've made an attempt in the design that you have before you on this next page to take a look at the placement of the town green, uh, so-called, and we come up with a model that replaces the sketch we had earlier. If you recall the, the earlier green uh, that was in somewhat the same location but is now, uh, is now occupied by a single family home, it was somewhat off to one side. The comment was it would be nice if this first phase neighborhood had a focal point, some place that was surrounded by homes, that was well defined, perhaps it had some trees, perhaps it uh, retained some natural character on the site. What we've done is established a, a central green area that's about 230 feet in length by about 150 feet in width. Uh, this is certainly not large enough for a regulation ball field or soccer field. It's enough for a neighborhood uh, recreation area. It's a relatively level area. It'd be a great place to go out and play, pick up uh, softball or soccer, or toss a frisbee around. Uh, we're showing on the sketch plan uh, single-family homes. Uh, there are seven or eight of them that surround it. Uh, the two on the Alicia Circle right here would probably have side porches that look out to the neighborhood green. Uh, the separation between the public and the private space is one thing which is going to be very carefully worked out here. We're showing on the sketch either a stone wall or a hedge or a fence or something that makes the distinction between the public space and the private space. Uh, the fact, though, that it is the focal point of phase one, 
It's surrounded on three sides by a sidewalk. There is a wonderful old oak tree in the middle of the, the space on the, the southern end of it. Uh, it could be a very exciting part of the overall project. And we feel this is probably one of the first part of the developments that will be built. Uh, as we develop that, uh, the sketch, it caused us to rethink the placement of some of the other homes. Uh, we've had to readjust the alignment of Dominica's Crossing. On the sketch, you can notice a couple of dotted lines where the old alignment used to be uh, for both Dominica's Crossing and for Alicia Sir. starting to do a series of character sketches to show the planning board the, the design intent and designing uh, the development. This is a sketch uh, that Dan Rabbit from our office did looking northward on Dominicus Crossing Road as it goes through the, the development. This is the town green, about 150 feet across here, uh, 230 feet front to back. There may be a focal point like a, a town bandstand or at some raised portion of the development to act as more of a, a, a drawing card for the development. These are the two homes on the side that I mentioned before, and some means of separating the public from the private uh, street. Here's a little circle that comes off one side, bends around, comes out on the other side over here. Uh, on the right side, we have Lorenzo Lane that takes off and goes down the hill. Uh, we are showing street trees that would line the road. Uh, in this particular part of the site, there's not a lot of trees to begin with. This is the land right in back of Mr. Perez's uh, barn, but the land has been cleared. There are a couple of specimen trees. We're showing the big uh, oak tree right here. There's a couple of big pines here and here that will be saved as part of the alignment uh, of the property. In fact, you can see that the pines here and here uh, that we've uh, used as guideposts in laying out the road. Um, that certainly is the the largest uh, change that we've made to the overall alignment in, in, in terms of phase one. What it ends up with then is a, a space that looks out over the Spurwick River. We feel that's a, a easily walkable focal point for the people in phase one, roughly 45 odd homes. Uh, it does provide a lot of open space possibilities. Uh, it's a high amenity value space. And in terms of uh, looking at this uh, phase one again, we took a closer look at the first lot that you come to. Uh, this was called lot one, and we had a quandary there. Um, it was called a, a single house lot. Uh, it was about 1.4 acres. And looking at it again, we felt that there may be an opportunity to put an initial home on there so we don't have a, a situation where uh, the backside of the home faces Lorenzo Lane or conversely, if the house is built facing Lorenzo Lane, you wouldn't see the back of the house as you drove in the development. And talking with Mr. Anastas, this may be the place uh, where the first house, or maybe even a model home, might be built uh, as you drive up the entranceway. The planning board also had some concern uh, about what the entranceway was going to look like, the character of it relative to landscaping, uh, earth moving, earth forms, additional trees, and so forth. In laying out the road, um, we have taken into consideration good engineering practice. Um, Les Barry from dh 2 m can discuss some of the concerns that we heard earlier. Someone in the audience uh, pointed out that we don't want a situation as the road, Dominicus Cross, comes down onto Wells Road, where someone puts on the brake during the wintertime and slides out into Wells Road. In laying the road out, we have used the town standards, I believe are 3% for the first 50 feet. Uh, so it does meet the town standards, so it does meet going into a ledge outcrop over here, uh, but that's the way it's being designed uh, to make sure that it's a safe, uh, safe stopping distance and safe line of sight. Uh, this is an initial sketch we've done, taking a look at how the ledge outcrop might be treated, be cleaned up, some additional plantings installed on either side. Uh, there will be a fair amount of ledge, probably uh, six to eight feet at the deepest point, it will also act as a barrier between uh, Susie Terrian's house, which is over here, uh, and the entranceway to the development on the right side of the ledge outcrop. Uh, in terms of signage, we have not yet worked out a design for it. Uh, we don't want to have a big, splashy entranceway. Um, in a, another project that we've been working on with Peter Anastas, we've come across a stockpile 
of old granite uh, pieces that were left over from the demolition site. Um, we have uh, several dozen of those, uh, some of which may be used as part of the entranceway. Uh, a couple of pieces of cut granite are located on either side of the entranceway, just to give an indication of a sense of permanence that we want to establish as people drive in off of the road. Um, if anything, there may be a, a little bit too much clearing on either side here. I think it's the intent to make this a fairly naturalistic entranceway. Not a lot of uh, introduced plantings, but uh, keep it as naturalistic as possible, saving as much as the, as the vegetation as possible, probably introducing some additional evergreen plantings on top of the ledge for additional screening purposes. And as we go around the corner, uh, using either low mound or uh, additional fencing to provide further buffer uh, for Susie Tarion, this homeless lot is down here. We heard a, a number of people talk about the need for recreation areas, uh, ball fields, trails, and so forth uh, throughout the development. When we did the rendering uh, before you right now, um, we did so with an eye towards looking at the open spaces uh, and the connections that could be made between the spaces that are being proposed, the neighborhoods that are being proposed, uh, and the adjacent properties uh, where there are trails already. You can see uh, as part of the saffron colored line, uh, the combination of trails that are there right now along the power line, for example, uh, there's a trail up here that cuts diagonally through the property. Uh, there are some trails that go uh, from the end of uh, what is now going to be the cul-de-sac um, Lorenzo Lane that cuts over uh, to the power line. Uh, as we indicated uh, several weeks ago, most of those trails will be preserved where they are going to be disturbed, they will be replaced, for example, in this location right here by a sidewalk that allow people who are, are used to walking through the woods to continue to walk in that general direction and then ultimately to get onto trails. We are showing a number of new trails, uh, for example, up and through here. Um, down and through here is the Boy Scout land, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, that uh, will be built by the developer. We, we have not yet come to an agreement yet to show exactly where the trails will be. Uh, it will be done as part of this development. Um, when I say built by the developer, I mean um, either constructed as part of the development of the project uh, or an arrangement will be made with an organization such as the Boy Scouts who have expressed a willingness to work uh, on projects within the development as part of either a merit badge work uh, or a community service project. Um, we're looking at ways to uh, construct trails across wetlands. I've given uh, town planners some additional information for new systems of supporting trails and boardwalks above wetlands that minimize, minimize disturbance, that require no fill in wetlands, and we'll be showing you details of those systems as we go through the development process. Um, we are showing uh, several small recreation sites. Uh, for example, on Dominicus Crossing uh, at the junction between the first phase of development and the northern half of the site, there is a wonderful overlook above the wetland, which is over here, quite a steep bluff, that we felt would have made a wonderful house site, but it is within the 250 foot buffer zone. Um, it's also centrally located to the entire development, and we feel that would be a, a wonderful place for a small picnic area. A um, place for a couple of tables. At this point, uh, there's also a trailhead. It's very easily accessible uh, by foot or by bicycle from <laughs> virtually anybody that's in the, in the development. Um, someone mentioned the need for a court game or some place for a hard surface facility. We are showing places where those may occur. We're at this point not proposing to build those. Uh, we're not sure exactly what the need are given the relative size of the lots here. Uh, but we, there is a location right here, which is another buildable area outside of the, the wetland buffers. There's another area on the south side of, of Dominicus Crossing um, off of uh, Sawyer Road there. We could have a small basketball court or half court. Um, these are areas that are, for the most part, uh, in this location, away from homes. Uh, this one right here has homes on either side of it. They have to be sited with quite a bit of care. But there are locations on the property where you could have facilities such as uh, a half basketball court or some additional picnic areas. One thing which um, we had not encountered uh, up until uh, about a week and a half ago uh, was uh, some criticism from Central Maine Power Company. Uh, we had assumed all along some of our initial comments that we'd be able to 
lining the road, as we're showing in this diagram that you saw recently. Uh, so a portion of it went underneath the power lines and wove back and forth uh, through the, the power poles that are out there, very much the way that um, the subdivision on the other side of Sawyer Road, Elizabeth Farms, is located in the portion of their road. However, we received a, a comment from Central Maine Power Company asking us, asking us to take another look at the way that this portion of the road was located. There were several hundred feet uh, where the road um, seemed to parallel the power line in a way that uh, the CMP felt may be an impediment if they wanted to expand their facilities out there to widen the, uh, their line of service or reduce other improvements in the future. You notice then that there's been quite a change made between the plan behind me and the plan over here. We've taken the alignment that made a big loop up and around, straightened it out to some extent, uh, worked with the contours and the wetlands, and came up with a plan that essentially uh, adds a couple of hundred feet to the road, but at the same time uh, takes away 800 feet of Dominicus Crossing Road. This would be Dominicus Crossing right here. Um, in making this alignment, uh, we have eliminated the, the road that was called Chesterwood Trail before. The advantage of this, of course, um, and it's a, uh, it results in a fairly significant uh, change in the wetland impacts. Uh, the way the, the road was laid out before, uh, as we came around the, the power line, there was one corner uh, where it lived a, a fairly significant part of a, of a wetland area. Excuse me. Um, by bringing the road in this location, we're avoiding that wetland altogether. Uh, in doing so, we're working into the topography. Uh, we feel it also unifies these neighborhoods uh, uh, in this area in a way that uh, we felt was somewhat problematic in the earlier scheme. And the final thing that we've done uh, that was included as part of your package, again, this is uh, a direct result of the comment that was heard by the Pine Board last time. Uh, we did have two dead-end roads, Arabella Way and Virginia Way. And the comment was made, uh, wouldn't it be nice if those two could be connected and sort of a elongated jug handle or a big loop at the end of the uh, Layton Road. Uh, we looked a little bit uh, more carefully at that area, but we felt that if by bringing a loop road there and a loop road right there, those loops could just be stretched out. We're, just, we're actually paving just as much road uh, to come with one continuous loop uh, that connects from one end to the other of late road than we would have been before with the two dead end roads. So uh, it was a practical decision. It was also uh, one that we feel uh, would result in a much better neighborhood. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion in many communities about dead-end roads relative to fire protection, school bus pickup, and so forth. Uh, the concern that we had uh, was for the privacy of people who live at the dead, end of the dead-end roads. We feel, however, by uh, locating this large loop at the end of Layton Road, the people's privacy in this, this part of the site, which are the largest uh, lots, the two to three acres uh, size, will not be um, um, put in question. Uh, we're still looking at an extension of the road that could happen in the future uh, over to the Jordan property and on the southerly part of the site uh, over to the Layton property. Uh, one other thing which I did not point out yet uh, was a, a additional treatment uh, to the eyebrow that uh, is located now on the east side of Sawyer Road. If you recall, the previous plan had an eyebrow here and another eyebrow down here. Uh, again, we're looking at uh, both designs. We felt that the eyebrow down here uh, is something that no one seemed to be feeling very strong about. Uh, and with the addition of the town green down here, very substantial size that really obviated the need for that sort of space. Uh, looking at the comments that we heard from Fred Moore from T.Y. Lynn, he had some real concerns about traffic flow, uh, whether or not people are really going to obey the one-way system or two-way systems that take shortcuts and so forth. Uh, we've done a little bit of redesign work on it. Uh, Dominicus Crossing will go straight through here. We're now uh, re-establishing Chesterwood Trail as this, uh, this crescent road here that would have uh, three or four homes on it. Uh, the main through road is straight. Uh, it's very clear that Chesterwood Trail is a little road, a little spur road off of it. Uh, we've also enlarged it slightly. Uh, it's not quite as large 
There's a town green down here. It's certainly nowhere near as flat, but it does uh, have a wonderful old oak tree on the top of it. It does provide enough room for informal gathering. It's not the sort of place that you go to play frisbee or kickball, uh, but it does provide a nice focal point, and it really could be a place for neighbors to gather if they are so inclined on a Saturday afternoon. So those are the changes that we've made, uh, I hope, in, in talking about those issues. We've addressed most of the concerns and the comments we've heard uh, from the parties that have addressed the planning board in the public hearing. Thank you. Mr. Dewan, uh, how do you propose to address Mr. Bannon's concern about the number of houses permitted? Will we see some revised calculations the next time from you? One of the things we talked about the last time uh, was um, the order by which we review the, the development. And uh, I think that we talked initially uh, about looking at the net residential acreage calculation because we felt that was the, the element which drove the entire uh, design of the subdivision. And I think that most of the members that are with us tonight, maybe one or two exceptions, were here at the planning board Several months ago, we started to talk about calculation, the net residential acreage calculations, how the board has treated things like uh, wetlands, depth of bedrock, um, steep slopes, and so forth, uh, historically. Uh, we've worked very closely with Maureen O'Meara, the development of the plan. Uh, we had advice from her relative to applying the board's standards and the board's policy towards net residential acreage calculation. Uh, and in drawing up her preliminary plan, we feel that we use the board's policies and the guidance from the ordinance uh, in addressing the number of house lots that would be able to be built here. Our calculations uh, show that we could be building as many as 111 houses on the development site. If, if you would like, uh, we could prepare uh, a response to the, the memo from Mr. Bannon. I have not seen a copy of it. I would like to have a chance to look at that. I, for one, would be interested in a response to it. <clears throat> Maureen, I'm sure you can get him. Absolutely. All right. Anyone else have a question for the applicant while he's standing, or we just want to begin a discussion? <clears throat> Break the sequence. Well, like, lack of uh, enthusiasm here. I'll, I'll jump into the uh, need to stretch it. Pro. Um, what I'd like to do is, is uh, just pick up on a couple of the uh, butters' uh, concerns. Um, this board has quite a task before it in reviewing uh, a 90-plus unit uh, subdivision, at least in context of this community. Uh, one thing that was not mentioned this evening, but I think it's important both from the, the board's uh, viewpoint as well as everyone attending the meeting and everyone at home, is that this site didn't appear out of uh, nowhere and become a site selected for development. Uh, the site was identified as part of the town's comprehensive plan uh, and is therefore uh, as a growth area and is therefore uh, being looked at very seriously. Furthermore, in the early uh, discussions with the applicant, the issue of, of uh, bedrock and, and septic systems came up, and it's the understanding that the applicant has, is proposing a uh, public uh, sanitary sewer system, has reviewed that with the town council, and the town council has, I believe, approved the applicant's uh, proposal. What the, what the council has approved is the, they've given them permission to connect, and they've withheld final approval for the actual detailed drawings, but yes, they have to have Improving. confirmed okay. approval to connect. Uh, as a fellow landscape architect, I, I would like to address concerns about uh, cynical, um, cynical clustering. Um, I think when everyone has to deal with the current wetland regulations, whether local, state, or federal, uh, there are many instances that we all come across where we're wondering if we're uh, really uh, missing the uh, forest for the trees. Um, and it's a very, I think, uh, uh, 
true fact that indeed the plan does essentially find its way around the wetlands. Uh, I have not seen many plans to date that don't. And the reason they do is because uh, if you disturb more than a certain percentage or, or a square footage of wetlands, uh, your plan will never be approved by the Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, it's a simple fact. And for any design professional to uh, run a client through the wetlands out of uh, a very strong idea about superimposing a grid over a very difficult property uh, would uh, lead one into, I think, significant litigation. Now, that doesn't mean that a plan shouldn't have a vision and it shouldn't have a theme. And this, and this planning board has certainly uh, been working with this applicant and hoping that in keeping with the with town's uh, comprehensive plan and, and goals for uh, uh, maintaining rural character, that that's, that's part of this process. What we're concerned about is the New Jerseyfication of Cape Elizabeth and its Wiggly Road subdivisions that don't uh, create areas that are very different uh, in, in Cape Elizabeth than they would be in, in uh, Freehold, New Jersey, or some other such place. It's really, I think, uh, what we heard from the uh, uh, butters and, and public this evening is a concern about character in Cape Elizabeth. And this planning board uh, has historically and will continue to work very hard. I think that's one of the most difficult aspects of, of doing this, where one is balancing the issues of impacts, the uh, town requirements for road alignment, wetland impacts, and coming up with something that, that in and of itself has a very strong identity. Uh, there was concern about uh, change uh, in the neighborhood. Um, that's, I think, one of the most uh, prevalent concerns in, of residents in Cape Elizabeth, and the Planning Board continues to address that. With respect to this plan, we took the neighborhood to be the town neighborhood in general, and we will be looking at the specific issues relative to this application. Uh, as it moves forward, but the, the, the voice of the town neighborhood is expressed in the comprehensive plan, and that is implemented through the town council and our zoning ordinances. Um, and, and from that basis, this applicant certainly has standing uh, before the board in, in terms of the type of development that they're proposing. Um, with, with the issue with respect to uh, density, uh, density is, is I think uh, a twofold question. One is the overall uh, uh, density of the site, which relative to most development in Cape Elizabeth is of moderate to low density. Uh, we don't have four and five acre lots spread throughout 200 acres here, but relative to the entire parcel, 90 units is, is relatively low density. The perceived density, however, as one goes down the main access road is going to be uh, higher than that because of the, uh, the clustering provision. But it's not terribly different than many successful neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth, whether they're Oakhurst or other areas. And, uh, and again, the planning board is, is working with the developer. And I think what we're coming to with respect to that is the crux of the issue is the uh, net residential development. And uh, that's going to be first thing on our, on our agenda. Um, I, I, I would like to point out once again with the issue of, of cynical clustering that uh, what is referred to as cynical clustering, and I, and I understand that, that term. I think it's sort of an interesting notion um, that really one, one wonders whether any applicant out of the goodness of their heart wants to leave land to the uh, citizens of Cape Elizabeth as open space or whether simply they're handcuffed because of the ordinances to develop any more than they're, they're uh, proposing. But on the other hand, what's defined as cynical clustering was indeed what Ian McCarg, who was sort of the uh, grandfather of... Uh, environmental planning and design uh, and head of the University of Pennsylvania's program in landscape architecture and planning calls uh, uh, design with nature. And that was the rage certainly during the 70s and, and much of the 80s. Um, but with the advent of neo-traditional neo planning, um, there's a desire to get rid of the wiggly, windy roads that avoid the wetlands and superimpose over uh, a site, uh, a system of grids, uh, recalling the, uh, the nice new towns of the 20s. Um, I think that we stated to this applicant early on in the process that we're all in a, 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 we're on a, a path of discovery here, that we want to avoid certain things, but we all don't know what the vision is of what it is that we're trying to create. And I would encourage all of the abutters and everyone who had concerns this evening to follow through in this process with <coughs> us, as we, we sort of hope to come up with a unique subdivision here that has